Professor Bernard Ziegert is a professor for the theory and history of cultural techniques at the Bauhaus Universität Weimar. He studied German literature, comparative linguistics, philosophy, Judaic studies, and history at the Freiburg Universität. He was also Friedrich Kittler's Forschung assistant. He was an assistant professor and chair of aesthetics and history of media at the Berlin Humboldt Universität. And currently, he is a professor at the Weimar, uh, at the Weimar uh, Universität, where he holds a media technological think tanking um, under the auspice of the IKKM, Internationalen Kolleges for Kultur, Technik, Forschung and Medien Philosophie, which he co-directs since 2008. Um, part of his very, very long list of publication is Relays, Literature as an, epo an, an Epoch of the Postal System, and Passagiere und Papiere. Today, Professor Siegert will, will speak, uh, will, will, will speak about the Korine of the Pirate, a Hitlerian view on the origin of the Dutch seascape. Professor Siegert. Listening to Rüdiger's wonderful talk, uh, it occurred to me that the subtitle of my paper would um, much better be the Dutch seascape, a misuse of naval war techniques. Um, but I needed uh, really good to remember me to this old rock music paper. <clears throat> um, first of all, I'd um, like to thank everybody who made it possible to letting me hear, and um, especially, especially um, my thanks go to Arne Höcker and um, Avital, <clears throat> especially and most of all to Avital. <clears throat> Avital, let me tell you one thing. If your narcissism uh, needs some input, let me know. I'm ready to praise you endlessly. Yeah, I'm always like that. I'm <laughs> <laughs> body to soul. <laughs> When he came to look old, he loved to utter Greek phrases. When he spoke otherwise, he spoke a nearly or a nearly high German. <clears throat> Dialectic implants came from the Baden idiom. Badener dialect. And they were all, and they were all highly artificial. Evidence of this connoisseurship of the dialect, which took the place of a natural possession of that dialect. The Baden expressions that he used, uh, like Schwammeln, um, the Baden expressions that he used were political insofar as they marked his transplantation from the Saxonian to the Baden area, marks of the flight of him and his family from the East, and at the same time, the rejection of his original Saxonian. The Kittler German was a political German. <clears throat> the Baden idiom that was meant to reject the attachment to one origin and to prove artificially the attachment to another was replaced in the end by the Greek. When Friedrich said that the mother tongue of us all was Greek, he actually wanted to say that we all speak the Baden dialect. <laughs> that is, that we reject an origin which is lost already and at the same time displace it to be able to communicate with it under the cover of something else. Ironically, something similar happened when he spoke English and we all know how bad his English was. On the one hand, he hated the English language, because this linguistically incarnate pragmatism resisted so awfully in ontologizing language like the German language. How do you translate nur was schaltbar ist, ist überhaupt, Geoffrey? <laughs> when he asked, kann man das schalten? He did not mean, can you switch it on? Schaltbar does not mean something which, you can, which can be switched on and off. 
It means something that can be realized as a switching circuit. On the other hand, he admired the English language because he mapped, because it mapped the switching circuit to the level of language because of the simple structure of the English grammar, which is the reason why English is so perfectly fit to create programming languages. The lack of flexions makes it possible to add nouns of a nearly arbitrary number without creating grammatically incorrect expressions like time, time axis, time axis manipulation, and so forth. He hated and admired the English language, and that is probably the reason why the English disclosed his Saxonian accent. He spoke English with a Saxonian accent. Thus, the orig origin that was rejected in German could report back in English disguise. The memory of a Greek origin of our knowledge of a Seinsgeschick delivered by the sirens is a displaced memory in the sense that the Baden dialect marked a displaced origin, a cover memory, Deckerinnerung, in the Freudian sense. Where do I find the origins of our institutions, of our pol political notions, of friend and foe, of technology, of art and literature? Are they always already disclosed, as Friedrich wanted it, by islands in the sun and the deep blue Mediterranean sea, by blooming meadows, bee hum, sweet water, honey, music, and free love, by Kittler's ancient Greece, or more precisely, by Woodstock? <laughs> or do I find them in displacements which is the reason why our academic learning and our knowledge needed the psychoanalysis, discourse analysis and media analysis. Kittler, the reader of Nietzsche and Pynchon, taught us when he displaced the truth of the philosophers about the origins of meaning from the side of the subject and self-presence and restaged it on a different side, first the side of the Lacanian and unconscious, unconscious and then the side of technical media. Therefore, let me tell you about brave seamen, but not of brave Ulysses, but of brave Zealanders, Hollanders, and Frieslanders. Let me keep silence, silent about sirens. Let me speak about pirates. Modern metaphysics, says Heidegger, found an epoch in which being, in the sense of das Seiende, is inter interpreted as objectiveness. The techniques of, his, of this epoch that have the power to call something into being are the techniques of representation. Only what, can be repre only what can be represented is an object. That is, only what can be represented is at all. Friedrich's early version of this techno-ontology was the formula I men just mentioned, nur was schaltbar ist, ist überhaupt. Only what can be realized as a switching circuit is at all. Friedrich's late version of that techno-ontology went by the name of Aphrodite. Aphrodite, foam arisen. Let him have Aphrodite, let me have the foam. And those who navigate it, who navigate the seam between land and sea, and place it as the horizon from which pictorial representation arises. Into this furnace I ask you now to venture, you whom I cannot betray. So let me take you from the blue Mediterranean Sea to the grayish-greenish waters of the North Atlantic. In 1943, the Tyrolean State Museum received as a gift a painting of the Harlem painter Henry Cornelis Wurm. which shows the seventh day of the battle between the Spanish Armada and the English fleet. Hendrik Wurm painted it probably after his return from England, where he had been introduced to Lord Howard, the English admiral who commanded the English fleet in 1588. The painting is signed and it can be dated to the year 1600 or 1601. Taking this painting as a starting point, I would like to point out some ideas about the origin of the seascape, which place a piece of painted canvas in a relation to a number of military and technical operations 
which again the back, against the backdrop of the Dutch spatial revolution brought about a set of relations between painting, piracy, techniques of navigation, and nation building. I wish to do that for a, I wish to do that for a painting what Friedrich has done for texts, and what he called with Foucault discourse analysis. In contrast to hermeneutics and deconstruction, discourse analysis is not a method which is suited to, to describe single literary texts. Discourse analysis, Kittler wrote in a volume that has been edited by David Welbery on Kleist's Erdbeben in Chile. Um, discourse analysis, quote Kittler, can always only start with a set of statements. Its course is the cross-linking which has integrated, factishly is issued discourses into dispositives with a certain space, within a certain space and within a certain time. But not only, end quote, but not only discourses are organized to form dispositives, but also practices. Discourse practices, image practices, non-discursive knowledge and techniques like the use of instruments in navigation. Conventional art history has understood, has understood the invention of the Dutch seascape as a result of a development within the history of style in the course of which the imaginary depth superseded the vertical surface of the image support, the low, low horizon of the cartographic perspective, the, re, the realistic representation of nature, the religious themes, and the concealed gradations of space were replaced by the continuous transition of image grounds. The artist Alan Secula, on the contrary, has described the invention of the seascape as a result of the entry of maritime space into history. This maritime space is not an interior affair of art history. It is a new order of space in the sense of Carl Schmitt, a new nomos, a nomos of the sea. It is defined first by a pre-industrial capitalism based on trade and original accumulation, second by a reorientation of war from land to sea, as well as by a claim for naval supremacy by the Dutch provinces, third by cultural techniques like cart cartography and navigation, and fourth by the navigation, integration of political representation and maritime motives into a panoramatic space. The seascape is not the result of a coming to terms with the problems of representation of representing the immense spatial depth of the sea, but result of a spatial revolution. But what do we mean when we speak of space? Maritime space cannot be separated from the practices of navigation that has disclosed maritime space, first of all. To shed a light on these metaphysical dimensions, I briefly turn to a primal text of the literature of cultural techniques. Numberless wonders, terrible wonders walk the world, but none the match for man, sings, sings the Theban choir in Sophocles' Antigone. Because, quote again, that great wonder crossing the, heavy, he, ho, crossing the heaving gray sea, driven on by the blasts of winter. It, that uncanny being, sets out to sea to travel the blackish seas. This setting out to sea in Sophocles' Greek is called korain, polio peran pontu korai. Korain is the verb form of kora. As Heidegger emphasized, kora is not to be mistaken for space in the sense of extensio. Quote Heidegger, the Greeks had no word for space. This is no accident, for they experienced the spatial on the basis not of place, topos, they experienced it as kora, which signifies neither space nor place, but that which is occupied by that what stands there. The place belongs to the thing itself." End quote. Kora is that which makes space so that something, a thing, may appear. But it is also the outside of the polis. Koreo, the verb, means to make place or to give room but it also translates as passing through, penetrating, traversing successfully. The korain of the ships is an act of setting up space, which precedes place and founds the capability to be at a place. It is the violence of an original space seizure 
and placeless realms, which is so terrible because of its immemorability, a vectorial effect, affect which causes a very first striation of the smooth, smooth space. The terrible Korine, which introduces a spatiality and a being of things outside the polis, which from the perspective, perspective of the polis has to appear as eerie, ghastly, and without rights, constitutes the possibility to rule the placeless as a maritime space, to found colonies, to visit foreign coasts, to dig, a, to dig a state and trade this year's wine, or to subdue other peoples. What can be called with Sophocles the Dutch Korine, and with Carl Schmidt the Dutch spatial revolution, that is the fact that a new sovereign state appears as an actor on the stage of world history because of, growing, of a growing alliance of small communities decided to make its fate depend on the conditions and possibilities of the maritime space is brought about by an actor network in which heterogeneous media of representation, practices of navigation, political, economic, and military strategies, and juridical discourses by and by form a stable dispositive in the way Hitler defined that process. This Korine of the Dutch inscribed itself in the form of the Dutch seascape of the late 16th, early 17th century. Henry Cornelis Vroom is said to be the father of marine, marine painting. For years after the victory of the English fleet over the Spanish Armada, Vroom was commissioned to provide the designs for a series of huge, ta huge tapestries which showed different episodes of the sea battle. The most terrible wonder that practiced the Korine for the Netherlands in the form of a menace that haunted the seas, which gave rise to the independent union of the general states, went by the name of the sea beggars, Watergeusen. Since the modest troops of the reb rebels had no chance against the army of the Duke of Alba, the rebellion could gain strength and cause effects by a kind of warfare which avoided a much, as, as much as possible battles of decision on land and transferred war instead to the sea, where it took the shape of operations, the character of which was something in between warfare and pirate assault, in the same way as the field of operations was something in between land and sea. Not on the high seas this new sea power of the Netherlands took shape, but in the coastal waters, estuaries, channels, fleets, and guts, a shape which has left its trace on the early examples of the seascape. The sea beggars were Calvinist pirates or freebooters, dep depending on the respective standpoint, which were ally allies of William of Orange, and although they did not act always under his orders. From 1568 on, various captains of the sea beggars haunted the sea between the English and the East Frisian coast, they captured Dutch and neutral ships. From 1570 on, William of Orange tried hard and not always successfully to, to transform the dispersed and independently operating caper vessel, vessels of the sea beggars into a war fleet under the command of an admiral appointed by himself. 1572, the sea beggars conquered in a surprise attack the cities of Brielle and Flissingen on Zeeland with the consequence that the provin provinces Holland and Zeeland attached themselves to the general uprising against Spain. The figure of the pirate, who used his excellent knowledge of the coastal waters to hold up fishing boats, to seize merchant vessels, and to raid villages in estuaries and on islands, turned into an agent of a new kind of warfare, which extended the war of siege against single places to the blockade of whole territories. After the sea beggars had successfully blocked the harbor of Amsterdam, they defeated a Spanish fleet under the command of Maximilian de Enin Comte de Bossu in the Battle of the Zuidersee in 1573. Since the sea beggars kept on pirating Dutch fishing boats and neutral merchant vessels, although their letters of mark entitled them only to take actions against the Duke of Alba, one can hardly call them a regular war fleet. But since they pursued the political 
as a political goal to drive the Spaniards out of the Netherlands, they can be seen as, as the medium that turned the revolt from 1566 into the beginning of the War of Independence. The sea beggars are a medium in that sense that they, like Cora, disappeared from the stage in as much as the maritime space began to dominate political representation. And they were medium too in the sense that their status kept on oscillating between regular war fleet and irregulate pirates. On some of Rome's images, we can discern the operative means by which the independence of the new state was eked out. It were mainly, mainly retooled boyars, flea boats, and flutes. Boyars are small, single-masted sailing boats able to navigate the tide lands. Flea boats were called the privateers of the sea beggars that were specialized to navigate in shallow waters like the so-called fleas between islands, channels, guts or estuaries because of their low draft. Because the flea boat was so small and maneuverable, it was not before long that it was adopted by pirates of other nations too. The flute then is an improved form of the flea boat that emerged from the small war of the sea beggars against the Spaniards. So, not by the appearance of a superhero called Leviathan, who like in Thomas Hobbes' theory concerning the formation of the state is produced by contracts between persons in the legal sense, the state of the Netherla Netherlands is born. But by the flocking together of boyars and flea boats, which do not organize themselves in the form of a naval unit, but emerge here and there as a mass, not large galleys, carracks, or galleons that could serve as allegories of the state, but boyars and flea boats, which do not suit for allegories and representative appearances of sovereign actors on the stage of history. An engraving after a drawing by Hendrik Vrom that you see here, shows the shapeless shape of this iconoclast power when it appears within the field of representation. <coughs> the image depicts the landfall of the fleet of Prince Moritz of Nassau consisting of 2,800 boats near the village of Philipp Philippine in Flanders. One can be tempted to classify this image as a variation of an allegorical representation of state power and national wealth like the extraordinary large engraving Slanzwellfahren from 1613, which shows the panorama of Amsterdam from the seaside. Against the backdrop of the city, the welfare of the country is emblematized, which results from maritime tra trade. Excuse me. In contrast, in contrast, here, we have only a mass of cutters, flea boats, yachts, and boyars, which knows neither a center nor a direction, and forms a forest of masts and spread sails as it spreads towards the coastal strip. The small vessels of the sea beggars do not form a unit, nor do they form a readable text, like in the Armada tapestries. They become undifferentiable, a sea of boats, a tidal wave that will befall the land. Soon, this piratical noise at the bottom of history was going to be superimposed by representations in which the former ships of the sea beggars became part of representation, representations of sovereign acts of state. The seascape has to be read as a cover memory. It covers that what no sovereign, once he had entered the stage of world history as a legal person, wishes to remember. Soon, the stories of pirate attacks that made no difference between friend or foe were replaced by founding narrations that talked of secret meetings on which oaths were sworn, declarations of independence issued, and political representatives elected. The undifferentiable swarming of boyars and flea boats, which for once appeared on Rome's engraving here, soon gave way alleg allegorical to allegorical representations which expressed the new political self-image of the cities, which expanded their sphere of control onto the oceans. See, for instance, Vrom's painting Gesicht ob Horn from 1622, 
are Simon de Flieger's painting from 1649, which shows the disembarking of the Prince of Orange. The yacht here turned into a Staten's yacht, Staten's yacht, a type of a vessels, vessel which became a much preferred motive of numerous Dutch seascapes. As the name, which means hunt, indicates a yacht, the same as in German, jagd, was a small privateer which was especially esteemed because of its speed. The Staten's yacht, on the contrary, does not hunt anything anymore. It exists only for representative reasons by transporting heads of state and war and war heroes from the pier to their ships and vice versa. The Staten's yacht is a metaphor in the literal sense. It constitutes the transmission between the state and its symbol, the ship of state. It is a monstrous sort of a ship that combines a former pirate's vessel with a monumental adornment at its stern. What originally was meant to become invisible in situations where land and sea get confused appears now as a vehicle for representative acts of state on the mirror of the sea, which now is degraded to serve the needs for representation of a state which rules the waves. In Lucas Janssen Wagener's Tresor der Seefahrt from 1592, one finds the following instruction for the passage, for the passage through the so-called Wielinge, which is a swashed channel between the sandbanks east, and east of the mouth of the river Schelde. What we have here are the sailing instructions how to sail into the mouth of the river Schelde and therefore into Antwerp. Quote, if you want to sail into the Wielinge coming from the west, set a course towards the tower of Ostende. Repeatedly read seven fathoms, but then you have to look out for the shoals in front of Wenduin. Go east to north and east north, east, east north, east, until Liswege comes into sight within Blankenberge, and until the house Terdost, Terdost is a ship's length afar from Liswege in the south. Then you are in the mouth of the Wielinge. Then, then put West Chapel close to the eastern end of the church of Heist, and you are on a good course. If the fireboat of Heist touches the church of Heist, you will not sail across the polder. If you see the tower of Middleburg, one line off east, and in the south, the tower of the city hall, then you are sailing the best deep water of the Wheeling. But if you want to sail through the shallow waters and of this entrance, you should know that you are reaching the eastern end of the sandbank. When you see Ardenburg stand above the bank of Katzand, then you have reached the end of this sandbank. And so on, and so on, and so on. What is described here is a practice of coastal navigation which has nothing to do with the determination of one's position by means of latitudes and longitudes, and nothing with the use of Jacob's staff, quadrant, and astrolabium. What is described here is, a rather, is rather a navigation by means of sight lines, lines of sight, which is based on, a re on readings of the compass together with the observation of landmarks and soundings. The pilot finds his position or the precise moment when he has to tack or to jibe by trying to place position or the precise moment when he has to take um, or to jibe by trying to play I mean, I'm confused here the pilot finds his position or the precise moment when he has to take or to jibe by trying to place visually certain landmarks like church steeples towers of city halls and navigational aids like floating lights and station poles and above each other or side by side of each other this kind of navigation by means of lines of sight is thus based on the movement of the ship which causes an apparent movement of the landmarks which are in a nearer or farer distance relatively to each other. It makes use of the effect that these are visible in such a way as if they were placed on one and the same plane. Thus, the length of, of a sandbank can be determined by waiting for the moment when a certain landmark Nocke, for instance, moves apparently through another landmark, Westchapel, for instance. Precisely that 
What is lost if you tilt a map or some other vertical topographical perspective into an extreme horizontal view, namely the possibility to easily determine the distance between two points, is turned into a practical use by, the, by this method of navigation. What art historians would attribute to um, the develop, de development of a realistic style or to a history of style which is driven by the desire for realism is thus put into a relation, put into a relation to a navigational technique. This is exactly what Friedrich Kittler would have called a non-hermeneutic approach. Navigare necesse est, the subject is not. That ships and towers come to hide other ships and towers was an optical phenomenon that draftsmen of sea, battles, or city panoramas tried to avoid by all means in the 16th century. But it is precisely this optical phenomenon which pilots appreciate and make use of, who in the shallow waters of Zeeland and Holland, where ships are everywhere threatened by drochts, sands, and gronds, have to find the passages to the harbors that are located in the arms of the Rhine Delta or in the Zuidersee. The job of the pilot is supported by a large-scale map on which the bearings or lines of sight are recorded that are mentioned in the sailing instructions. The design of these maps bears the, bears the striking detail of coastal profiles that are drawn along the coastlines and which inform the pilot about the appearance of the coast and the landmarks. The dual perspective, which is so typical for maps of this time, like here, let's say by Abraham Ortelius, or the choreographic city views published by Braun and Hogenberg, appears here to fulfill a very practical function. Wagner used the dual perspective, not like Jakob van Deventer or other draftsmen who worked for Ortelius or Braun and Hogenberg for aesthetic reasons to combine cartographic overview with the visual experience of a landscape, but because it is an adequate aid for the navigation by means of lines of sight. This feature is quite typical for the maps of Wagner. You find it on all maps that he has drafted and published. The coastal profiles, which look like folded up rims of the mapped mainland, however, are poor in detail because of their small scale and this thus only of minor value for the pilot who sails close, closely under the coast. This is the reason why Wagner has integrated coastal profiles of especially dangerous passages in the maps of his Spiegel der Seefahrt. In his Tresor der Seefahrt, he inserted coastal profiles which inform as precisely as possible about the appearances, appearance of the coast directly above or below the sailing instructions. Lukas Janssen Wagner was no cartographer, but a pilot from the city of Enkhuizen. His life and work was closely connected to the business of the sea beggars, these uncanny beings who practiced the space constituting Korine of navigation by means of lines of sights in the guts and fleas. Enkhuizen, a small fishery harbor, located on the west coast of the Zuidersee, changed during the lifetime of Wagner into a city of 16,000 inhabitants, in the harbor of which moored ships from India, East Asia, and the West Indies. Soon after the sea beggars had started to attack Spanish ships and raid harbors loyal to the Spaniards, he made use of his talent to draw and started to publish his professional knowledge about the navigation of the coastal waters of Northern Europe in the form of specially designed maps coastal profiles and sailing instructions. Proudly, the author of the Tresor der Seefahrt adds to his name the specification Stiermann wohnende binnen Enkhuizen, that is, pilot living in Enkhuizen. What we find in Wagner's opus thus is not the perspective of the geographer who perceives the territory or surface seen from above, but the perspective of a pilot who stands at the helm of a kark, a boyer, or a flea boat and for whom a territory offers the sight of a coastal strip which barely rises above the horizon. However, one encounters strange irregularities if one cuts out the coastal profiles in Wagner's so-called 
Passkarten, that are these maps seen from above, and rotates them in such a way that one can compare them point by point with the horizontal coastal profiles from the Tresor der Seefahrt. Let's take, for instance, the Zeeland map from the Tresor der Seefahrt and the corresponding diagram that shows the coastal profile which belongs to the sailing instructions for the passage through the Wielinge cited above. While the intervals between the landmarks of Blankenburg, Liswegen, Heist and Nock, Nocke in both coastal profiles match rather precisely, an enormous distortion occurs in the moment when our imaginary vessel enters the mouth of the River Schelde. The two places, Flushing and Middleburg, on the island of Zeeland, which are placed on the map one above the other, and which therefore should appear on the diagram behind each other, appear separated from each other by an enormous lateral interval, which contains three additional church steeples which aren't recorded on the map at all. How can this distortion be explained? My thesis is that the diagram of the coastal profile does not represent the coast as it would appear to a sailor under the assumed conditions of central perspective, but piecewise as seen from various perspectives from different directions as it appears successively to a pilot on a vessel that, sa that sails along the coast. What we see on the left of the entrance into the River Schelde is not the view of a coast as it would appear to a sailor who has looked from a northwestern direction into the segment of the coast, onto the segment of the coast between Blankenburg and Sluis, but the view of the coast of Zeeland, first from a much more closer distance and second as seen from direction southwest, which implies a rotation of nearly 90 degrees to the left, which I have indicated here by the blue lines. This corresponds, by the way, to the lines of sight which are plotted in Wagner's um, Passkarte overall map. Hence, various dif different perspective, perspectives have been integrated in one and the same diagram of the coastal program, uh, profile. We must not perceive the diagram of the profile as a result of a projection of the coastal profile according to the laws of central perspective, as we would see it from a fixed position and a unified angle of sight, but as a piecewise projection of a curvilinear trajectory onto a plane that accounts for the tacking of the ship into the mouth of the River Schelde. The maritime space of the Dutch seascape was constituted by a perspective that was informed by the practice of navigation by lines of sight. What looks like a coastline that nearly melts into the horizon on Rome's painting, the seventh day of the naval battle, is in fact a module taken from Wagner's Tresor der Seefahrt. The coastal profile in this painting corresponds exactly to the diagram of the coastal profile which represents the coast between Dunkirchen and Ostende. One can, in fact, insert it into the painting in such a way that the two profiles match each other. A comparison with Wagner's Carte van der Hollandse Kust, which also contains the corresponding segment, the panorama view of which appears in Worms' seventh day, produces evidence that the diagram of the coastal profile and hence also Worms' coastal panorama does not feature such extreme mappings of perspectival turns like the coastal profile between Blankenburg and Middleburg. Now you have it all. But still one has to concede as a fact that Worms' coastal panorama is the result of a simultaneous parallel alignment of non-parallel and successively taken bearings along lines of sight. What we do if we interpret Worms' coastal panorama as an object in the sense of modern metaphysics, which, accord to, which according to Heidegger grant the status of a being only to that which can be re represented as an object, is, that, is exactly what Valerie November, Eduardo Camacho Hübner and Bruno Latour have criticized in their recent text, text on cartography and navigation. Quote, we might have confused in the past two entirely different meanings of the word correspondence. 
The first seems to rely on a resemblance between two elements, signs on the map and territory, or more philosophically, words and worlds. While the, sec while the second emphasizes the establishment of some relevance that allows a navigator to align several successive signposts along a trajectory." End quote. Certainly, Latour et al. are right too if they continue that as a consequence, quote, maps have been aestheticized, 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 and fused with the emerging culture of realistic paintings, end quote. But they are wrong when they credit or discredit Dutch painting with the honor to be the culmination of perspective painting and held it responsible for having replaced a notion of maps as tra trajectories of successively processed operations with a mimetic or representational notion of maps. As my Kitlerian view can show, it is not the laws of mathematical geometry on which the first Dutch seascapes are based. It is a cultural technique of a piecewise recording of different bearings rooted in the piratical knowledge of warfare in coastal waters that is conserved, cons conserved and pacified in the realism of realistic representation. If my thesis is correct, and I think it is, this would mean, first, that the horizon in Dutch seascapes is not the same as the horizon in painting, on paintings that were created under, under the conditions of geometrical image constructions south of the Alps. A technical factor, the optical, mathematical, and philosophical condition for the construction of the image as such. The horizon in the Dutch seascape, on the contrary, would be an imminent object within the image, a coastal panorama that was infinitesimally thinned out until it became a line. Second, what appears in the early Dutch seascape as a panorama seen from one fixed standpoint is in truth the result of a parallel alignment of non-parallel successively past lines of sight. The seascape records, hides, and pacifies the Korine of the pirates, pilots, the experience of the operational space of the navigators and keeps it latent in the background of a space represented for the, for the state subject in his theater loge. In the case of modern representation, at least in as much it concerns the origin of marine painting, it is not the silencing of the sirens by the philosophers and monotheism, but the silencing of the pirates' Korine by the rise of the imperial nation state and its aesthetics that made room for an aesthetics of political allegories and the capitali capitalist sublime of the unlimited maritime space. A Kettlerian view on the origin of the seascape discovers that it is not based on Euclidean laws and their legal implication, but on the troublesome compromise between banishing at the same time and at the same time conserving secretly the Korine of the sea beggars. To quote a song that Friedrich loved, even damnation is poisoned with rainbows. Thank you. I was um, thinking, and this might be floating the signifier to, and the armada that you're <laughs> considering too um, lightly and um, surface writing here. I was thinking that for William Burroughs, the figure of the pirate is also, uh, for him, all these floating leather gay bars. Um, and that something happens in those um, decodified or uncodified um, communities of pirate ships that, that make me want to somehow um, graft them onto your very um, important um, determination to make this a political allegory. So um, you, you promised to talk about boys and toys, and I was very happy to see the semen all over the place. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to say, really. But, uh, <laughs> um, but thank you. I mean, um, it's always nice to have the feeling that someone understands. Uh, and 
one of the, those implementations of romanticism Rüdiger spoke of, that we still are happy with uh, this hermeneutic, hermeneutics works, um, despite all the media technology. But <clears throat> um, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I wasn't sure whether, I mean, I sh whether this would would be appropriate for this for this commemorative gathering, but um, I'm completely unable to do Kittler hermeneutics. So, um, uh, so I had to do something um, which I thought would be some kind of Kittlerian view on something, but a Kittlerian view that comes from the future um, and not from the past. And um, I think I think it's also not only important to. To, to sit here and mourn, and as it was said yesterday, uh, to, to think about ways how to receive uh, Kittler in a new way, and especially on this side of the Atlantic, as we are here in New York, uh, which, uh, by the way, started as a pirate nest, or a pirate net, n nest, uh, uh, Dutch pirates. Um, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> he knew Amsterdam. <laughs> And uh, so I, what I wanted to do is to, to, first of all, to do something that Friedrich never was able to do. Let me talk about images. Completely, he was completely unable to do that. Um, I don't know why. Uh, he did not really hate images, but he had no relation to them. I mean, he had relation to music and to texts, but uh, not to images. And uh, so I always um, uh, asked myself, uh, how, what, what could a Kittlerian approach to, to, to images be? And this is uh, one example of uh, how this can be done, that these, um, these, uh, these, this small war that he was so interested in when he talked about romantic literature, about Kleist, as well as his brother Wolf, um, the small war <laughs> that is behind or that constitutes uh, literature, um, uh, that this uh, is a story that is not restricted to, to German and Germanistic research, but uh, that can be made, still made very productive and, and useful. And um, I, th I see the, 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 the Seinsgeschichte much more like Foucault on the side of this small war, this noise of the of the anonymous anonymous people, pirates or whatever, uh, on the ground of the history, than uh, on these blue islands and this Woodstock fantasy of Friedrich. Mm. <laughs> Um, Bernard, thanks a lot. That was great. I just have two minor caveats. Number one, I sense a very slight Deleuzean romanticism. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. In a way, a lot of what you attribute to pirates could also be attributed less glamorous, glamorously to fishermen's knowledge. That's the one thing, whether we are building up this big opposition. Number two is, while I was listening to your talk, I was thinking of the novel, which I think you are familiar with too, and that is, of course, The Riddle of the Sands, as can told us, where precisely the era you talk about is now re-instrumentalized by the evil <coughs> Germans planning invasion. All the pirate novel, all the multimedia perspective, the fact that you have to be able to read the seas, that you have mm. to have line of sight, that you have to have maps and all that, come together, but now as the great state enterprise to invade Britain. So, in a way, there the binary then is taken over by the other side. Absolutely. Um, mm, yeah, I'm, I'm terribly ashamed because of this uh, Deleuzean, Gatterian undertone. Um, don't know. Um, I, I'm trying hard to get rid of that. Um, although I never was. I mean, but Mille Plateau was the only. I have the only thing I can say for my excuse is that the only book I, re I, I, I really loved is Mille Plateau. And I mean, I'm, I'm living in a city where everybody reads his cinema books, and which are completely unaccessible for me. And uh, and 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 I, I leave no. 
I leave no occasion out to 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 polemicize against uh, neo vitalism. And if there was anything that sounded of neo vitalism in my talk, please uh, uh, give me hit me and uh, <laughs> punish me, please. Uh, so uh, um, next point, yes. Uh, uh, yes, of course, it's, it's, it's just uh, fisher boats uh, practices, but these were exactly the practices the pirates used, and so it was important for me to, to make this connection between uh, Wagner, uh, the, the, the cartographer, or the pilot, um, that was uh, to show that there was these very close connections um, of these people to the, to the pirates. I mean, there, there is hardly, t it's in that time, and hardly, to, um, hardly impossible to make a difference between the both. And of course, uh, how do you, I, I never knew how to, how to pronounce him. Childers or Childers? Childers? Well, Childers, yeah, yeah, and you should know. Uh, Childers, yes, of course. Um, that is, um, I could have talked about that too, because it's exactly the same practice, the same, um, 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 making use of this undiscernibility between land and sea and the tidelands and, and the vat um, from which this uh, from which this 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 world historical danger of in, of an invasion of Great Britain comes from and uh, uh, but uh, the reason why I didn't want I knew that he, we are here on a conference sponsored by uh, departments of German literature. And although this is English literature, I, I, w I wanted to stay away from literature. I wanted to talk about an image. And um, that's why, otherwise I could have talked about the text. Everybody talks about text here, so I'm not. The mapping, the cartography, it has an archi it's an archival apparatus and, and, uh, and also a proto-cinematic apparatus with these multiple lines of sight, you know, that are spatialized mm. in mm. these different temporal stigma that are spatialized in the, in the image. So to what degree uh, can we begin to think about archival retrieval as a cinematic process? And this is one of the origin points of, of that cinematization. Um, we have sequential images that are spatialized on a, on a flat screen space. Second issue, and to kind of move it away from the Deleuzian, if there's any Deleuzian romanticism, is that uh, the Garden of Versailles was deliberately designed and engineered as a, a pedagogical exercise in military line of sight, and it's a very interesting study by uh, Chandra Mukherjee on that. So uh, again, you went to the garden and you had this aesthetic and, and militarizing, and it was really for the aristocracy and the military elites to go there and spend time recreationally, but also to train their gaze through this, all these geometrical uh, 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 spatial orders and uh, dispositifs that were planted into the actual landscaping of, of the Versailles garden. So there's a overlap with what you're discussing. Thank you, thank you very much. I, um, I didn't know about that. I, I always thought, as uh, nearly everybody, I think that the gardens of uh, uh, Versailles were perfect examples of geometrical garden design. And if this is not the case, I'm very glad and to hear that and, and to learn more about that. I mean, <laughs> the other point, um, I, Thank you also for that, it, although it never came to my mind that that was a possible association with what I had been presenting here, that you could relate it to. Um, but it, it occurs to me that it um, makes much, much sense uh, that, that one could relate it to moving images in that sense. I mean, I, I was just speaking about this optical effects that, you know, when you move along a coast that objects that are placed one after the other move relatively towards each other, but that, um, that there could be a relation to, um, to, 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 to cinema and, um, and to what you call archival retrieval um, of, of, of images um, as, a, as a possible media technology um, is a really intriguing idea because that would mean that these techniques, these um, techniques of piratical, piratical or 
fishermen's navigation uh, invaded media technology and now uh, serve as, as means of, 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 of um, retrieval of images or data and so on. That would be, of course, great to, 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 to study and to do and to find out whether, yeah, we could um, find evidence for that, yeah. Thank you very much.